Hello and welcome to this video where today we're going to be looking at how particles actually interact with each other. Now um, there are four different types of interaction altogether. On an everyday scale we see lots and lots of different interactions or lots and lots of different forces. So um, we see things like weight, we see things like air resistance and friction, um, lots and lots of different types of forces. Um, but really they just boil down to four different forces or four different interactions. Um, two of these we know really really well. Um, obviously we know the gravitational force, we experience it all the time. Now every single thing, oops, so everything feels this gravitational interaction or gravitational force. You're feeling it now, it's the thing, it's the attraction between you and the earth, it's the thing that keeps you on the floor basically. Um, but every single thing in the universe feels some sort of gravitational attraction. So this interaction works with any particles whatsoever. Um, we also know quite a lot about this electromagnetic interaction. We've been using this for quite a long time. You use this at GCSE because anything that's charged, so anything that has either has a positive or a negative charge, feels this electromagnetic interaction. If you're a neutral particle, like a neutron, for example, you don't feel this electromagnetic interaction. So you only feel it if you're a charged particle. And obviously, if you've got something that's positive, something that's negative, then the interaction you feel is an attractive one. If we made this into a positive charge, then the interaction that these two things would feel is a repulsive one. They would try and repel each other and push each other away. Um, now, virtually all of the forces we see around us can be described due to this electromagnetic interaction. So things like friction and everything is basically um, due to this particular force here. There are also two other interactions that we that we don't see on an everyday basis and that's this strong nuclear and weak nuclear interaction they don't we only ever see them work it basically at the nuclear level so if we need to be looking at, at the nucleus of an atom or smaller in order to see what they do now the strong nuclear interaction basically works on quarks so that works on any quarks so your up down strange quark all feel this strong nuclear interaction the weak nuclear interaction is kind of less picky if you like because this thing works on it works on quarks but also it works on leptons too so if you're a quark or you're a lepton then you would feel or you'd interact through this weak nuclear force now that you can kind of see just by looking at the range why they're called a, a nuclear force the, the size of the nucleus is somewhere in the region of 10 to minus 15 meters so the strong nuclear force only acts over the size of a, of a nucleus anything bigger and you don't feel this strong nuclear force the weak nuclear force acts on the, on a range that's even smaller than that it's about a thousand times smaller than the strong nuclear force so it acts on a really 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 small scale so really even if you're looking at nuclei, it, you don't see this thing really do very much at all. Um, we're going to look at the strong nuclear and the weak nuclear force in a later video. Um, the electromagnetic and the gravitational force, however, have got an infinite range. So they act over really, really big distances. And I suppose that's re one of the reasons really why we see them all the time. Um, because you can be a long way from something, but still feel the gravity of it. So we could be quite a long way out away from the earth but we still feel the gravitational force because it acts over a long range what is kind of interesting though is the relative strengths of these things so if for example we set the nuclear force to have a strength of one then the next strongest force down is electromagnetic force which is about 100 times weaker than the strong nuclear force so it's still really it's still kind of weak compared to the strong nuclear force so you can see why this is given its name much much weaker than that though is the weak nuclear force so it's very imaginatively titled because it's much weaker than these um, so it's about a factor of 10 to minus 7 weaker than this and it's about 10 to minus 5 weaker than the electromagnetic force so it's actually quite a, a weak interaction altogether hence the name what is kind of interesting is that the gravitational force is so weak compared to these it's a factor of 10 to minus 36 so all of these zeros compared to the strong nuclear force it's even weak compared to this weak nuclear force um, the only reason we actually feel it is because we actually have some really really big masses like the earth or like the sun and also they act over a really big range in particle physics however when we're thinking about really small things it's so weak compared to these three that basically we just ignore it so we basically just ignore gravity in particle physics altogether so it would be kind of nice to know 
how, basically how these four things work. They all work in essentially the same way. So there's a, there's a theory, it was, um, and a scientist came up with this theory in the 1960s, and it seems to work really, really well. So rather than use particles, what we're going to use is we're going to use some people. Oh, so these are my excellent drawing of some people. And they're going to be um, stood on their ice skates on some ice. And we're going to say it's really, really good ice because there's no friction whatsoever. And currently, they're stood completely still. No friction. So they're cu currently stood completely still. Now, this girl is going to have a basketball. Okay. Now, what she's going to do, she's going to throw this to her partner over here. Um, so as soon as she throws this, she stood still. When she throws this, it's like an explosion in GCSE physics. So her momentum to start off with is zero. Um, but when she throws this, this ball now has some momentum because it's moving in this direction. In order to conserve momentum, to make sure that the overall momentum is zero, then she has to start moving in the opposite direction. So she starts to move in this direction. So the ball's moving through the air, she starts to move backwards. He then catches the ball, and again, in order to conserve momentum, he then starts to move in this direction, so he moves away from her. So he moves in this direction over here, like this. So basically what they've done, by exchanging this ball, she's moving this way, he's moving in this direction, so by exchanging this ball, what they've really done is they've repelled each other. So this is a model of repulsion. So we could we could replace this girl and this boy with two positive charges, for example. So we could have a positive charge here and a positive charge here. Um, this positive charge could exchange or it could send out a particle in this direction. And in order to conserve momentum, it would mean that our positive particle moves this way. As soon as this particle is absorbed by this particle here, again, in order to conserve momentum, momentum it would move in this direction and so this particle moves this way this particle moves this way and so they've repelled each other so by exchanging a particle we could say this is our model of repulsion now we can also have a model of attraction it's a bit strange let's just rub these out compared to our model of repulsion because that's it i don't know about you but that seems to make sense to me um, we're going to swap these two around like this um, and this is where the analogy gets a bit strange, because instead of having a ball, we're going to have a boomerang. They're facing away from each other this time. And what the girl's going to do is she's going to throw the boomerang away from her. So she's going to throw the boomerang in this direction. Again, she, the momentum to start off with is zero. So when she throws the boomerang in this direction, then in order to conserve momentum, she's going to have to move in the opposite direction. So she's going to go in this direction like this. When she throws the boomerang, Oops. When she throws this boomerang, the boomerang obviously does what boomerangs normally do, and it goes round in kind of like a loop, and it's going to come round to this person here. Now, when he catches it, in order, again, in order to conserve momentum, he's also going to start moving, and he's going to move in this direction. So what we've got is we've got somebody moving this way, we've got someone moving this way, so they're moving towards each other. In other words, they've attracted each other. So we've got kind of a model where we can have both attraction and repulsion um, simply by exchanging a particle or exchanging a ball or exchanging a boomerang. So we've exchanged something, but in order to conserve momentum, it's made the things either move together or move apart. So the question then becomes, what is it that these, are, these things are exchanging? Because obviously if we had two protons, they're not exchanging boomerangs. So every interaction has got its own exchange particle that goes with it. So if we take, for example, our if we have our, our two protons again, both positive, then they, if we look at our thing up here, they they basically exchange this thing. So they exchange a photon. So for example, this proton would emit a photon in this direction, like that. So we have a photon. In order to conserve momentum, it means that this thing's moving that way. As soon as the photon is absorbed by this thing, then it moves in that direction. Okay. So by we have exchanged this particle and it's made these things actually move. The the other three forces have been working exactly the same way. Um, the weak nuclear interaction has got three exchange particles associated with it. Now for AS level physics, we're only actually bothered about two. We're bothered about this W plus particle 
and this W minus particle, we're not bothered at all about this Z particle. It doesn't appear in the specification, and actually they say you don't need to know anything about it. So it's just these two W particles that we're really bothered about. Um, the strong nuclear force is mediated, or the particles exchange things called gluons. And the gravitational interaction exchanges, so if you so you're, you are currently exchanging with the, with the particles in the Earth, some things called gravitons. So we've built up a picture of all of the particles that we could possibly think of now. So we've got six quarks. Now the six, we're only bothered about three. We're bothered about the up, the down, and the strange quark for AS level physics. But, but we also know that there's a charm, a top, and a, a top and a bottom quark. But we're not bothered about those because they don't appear in our specification. We also know there are six leptons. So there's an electron, a muon, and a tau particle, and their corresponding neutrinos. And now we've got these exchange particles that basically mediate the forces. So we've got our photon, which mediates the electromagnetic force. We've got our gluons, which mediate the strong force. Strong force. We've got our W particles, which mediate the weak force. And we've got this pink one. I've colored it in pink because we'd actually have never ever seen a graviton. We hypothesize, we think it's there, but no one's ever seen one. Um, but this thing, the graviton is the thing that we think mediates gravity. So we've now got, wind, as far as we're concerned, we've got three quarks, we've got six leptons, and really, we've, what we're really bothered about from an AS physics point of view is we're bothered about this electromagnetic interaction, which are the exchange of photons, and the weak interaction, which is the exchange of these W particles. So we know how, the, how these things act, um, um, and, and what basically want to do is we basically want to be able to use these things and look to see which interactions can actually take place and to do that what we need to do is we need to consider what things are conserved because in all of all four of these interactions certain things have to be conserved so for example energy is conserved we know that from GCSE physics energy is always conserved whatever energy you start off with you have to finish up with altogether Momentum's always also the same, and we've just used that in order to build up our analogy of how um, how these interactions work. But three other things also have to be conserved in any interaction we have whatsoever, and that's charge. So whatever charge we start off with, we have to finish with, and that's also the lepton number and the baryon number. So let's have a look at here. We've got pair production. We've got a photon that's becoming a positron and an electron. So let's check to make sure that all of these work. We'll, we'll assume that these two things work. We'll, we'll check these three things. So let's check to see, first of all, whether the charge works. So the symbol for charge is Q. So this is a photon. This has got a charge of zero. This is a positron. It has a charge of plus one. This is an electron. It has a charge of minus one. So if we look overall, plus one, minus one, this thing all together gives us an overall charge of zero. So we start off with no charge. In total, we've got no charge when we finished up, so this works. The charge beforehand is the same as the total charge afterwards. We can also do the same with baryon number, which is fairly straightforward. Well, this thing, a baryon is obviously a, a particle that's made up of three quarks. We've met that before. This is a photon. It's not made up of three quarks, so it's not a baryon. So that has a baryon number of zero. Both of these things are fundamental as well. They're not baryons. They're not made up of three quarks. So this has got a baryon number of zero, and this has got a baryon number of zero. So we start off with a baryon zero, baryon number of zero. Our total baryon number is still zero, so our baryon number has been conserved. Finally, if we look at our lepton number. Well, this is a photon. It's not a lepton. So again, it has a lepton number of zero. Now, this is an anti-lepton. So this is, this is the antiparticle of a lepton. So the lepton number of that is minus one. This is a normal particle. So the lepton number of that is plus one, like that. So again, our total lepton number is minus one plus one, so is zero. So we started off with a lepton number of zero. We finished up with a total lepton number of zero. So this works. So this interaction is OK. As far as we're concerned, this thing will work. Um, you can, and we can again do this with a number of different things. So for example, let's see if we could have a neutron, which changes it into a positron and an electron. So we can check that check to see whether that works using again charge and baryon number and lepton number so it might not be a bad idea to stop this video and actually see whether or not this interaction can actually take place so if you've done that hopefully what you found is that if we look at the charge well this thing is a neutron neutron so it has no charge 
this thing is a positron again, so it's charged with plus one. This is an electron, so it's charged with minus one. So in total, if we look at this, it's got a charge of zero. So we started off with a zero charge, we finished with a zero charge, and so that's fine. So as far as we're concerned, from a charge point of view, that's all hunky-dory. If we have a look at, for example, baryon number, now this thing is made of three quarks, so it is a baryon, so this will have a baryon number of plus one. It then becomes, over on this side, a positron and an electron. Now this isn't a baryon, so this is a baryon number of zero. This isn't a baryon number either, so that's a baryon number of zero. So collectively, we have a baryon number of zero. So we start off with a baryon number of plus one, but we've now got a baryon number of zero. So we haven't got what we started off with. So this doesn't work. Okay, so we can stop here. We could go and have a look on and have a look at the lepton number, but as soon as one of these doesn't work, then we can say that this, this interaction won't happen. So this we will never ever see, simply because the baryon number isn't conserved. So the final thing we want to look at is actually how we represent these, because there are there are some very clever ways to represent these called Feynman diagrams. Now Feynman diagrams are actually very very simple. They look like this. And really, what they show is, um, if we draw an arrow up here, you can imagine this is what happens as time passes. So what we've got is, if we draw a line along here, for example, if we look at what happened beforehand, what we've got is we've got an electron over here, and we've got another electron. Okay, And these things then repel each other. And to repel each other, if we think because this is a negative thing and a negative thing, this is an electromagnetic interaction, so they exchange a photon. So what this, so it may well be that this one has exchanged a photon, which is this representation here, and it's made these things repel away. So we start off with two electrons, and we finished with two electrons, like that. So these things are called Feynman diagrams, and they're really useful. They'll be really useful when, particularly when we look at the weak interaction. Um, for the time being, these Feynman diagrams, basically all they show is what particles you've got beforehand, What, which are these ones down here, these are the particles that are coming in. So we've got our two electrons, electron there, electron there. This, These particles show us the particles that are going out of the interaction. So we've got an electron here and an electron here. And then this thing in the middle, this thing, shows us the, the particle that was exchanged in order to make this happen. So this is our exchange particle. So basically, that's all a Feynman diagram is. It basically shows us, it basically shows us, really what we start off with, what we finish with, and how we actually got there, which is this bit in the middle. So just to summarise, what we've done is we've had a look at our four different types of interactions. We've had a look at an analogy for how they work. Um, we've then we then went on and had a look at the four different types of exchange particles for each of these interactions, and we we then came up with a method of checking whether or not interactions can happen or they can't happen, and then we finished off with a real basic look at what Feynman diagrams are. These things are going to be very important because when we look at the weak interaction very shortly, then we're going to take these and we're going to extend them just a little bit. So thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again soon.